uh, in the conscription crisis. He was one of our longest serving uh, Lord Mayors and he was there during the revolutionary period 1917 to 24 uh, and came very much to prominence uh, in 1918. Uh, and remain very prominent uh, in the years that followed. So, uh, can you please welcome uh, Thomas Morrissey? Lawrence O'Neill was a small, unprepossessing looking man with a lot of energy, a great gift of oratory, a wit, and an easy relaxed sort of manner which made it possible for him to criticize others without making enemies. Great gift. A few words about him and his career first of all before we move on to the, the keynote part. Lawrence O'Neill was born on the 4th of March 1864 at 7 Kings Inn Street. His father was a potato and corn factor or merchant. He operated near Smithfield Markets. Lawrence joined the business at the age of 15 or 16. He married Anne Fottrell from St. Dulux in 1886. Their, theirs was a close and abiding relationship. They had six children, of whom four survived. Lawrence's own background was strongly nationalist. He joined the Land League as a boy and became a strong supporter of the Irish party up to about 1912. In 1910, he entered Dublin City Council, having been elected for the Rotunda Ward. And on the council, he became noted for his concern for the less well-off and for women's issues. His image of the council was a very positive one. There was a lot of criticism of the council in the press and elsewhere. But he spotted the fact that the council, in the absence of an Irish parliament, the Dublin City Council became, in many ways, the voice of the people. And other radical councils like Limerick and elsewhere sent a lot of their resolutions up to Dublin to be confirmed by the Dublin City Council. In 1913, Lawrence O'Neill was the, practically the sole voice on the City Council supporting Larkin and the workers. Now, during these years he, had, he suffered two embarrassments. First of all, there was a housing inquiry, a local government housing inquiry, and the, the results were posted in the newspapers, naming slum landlords, among whom were some councillors, including Lawrence O'Neill. He was very indignant at this, and he wrote to the inspectorate involved and pointed out that his, the two houses of his that were concerned, he had spent a lot of money in, in revamping re, re them and putting them in good condition and charged very little rent. And after re-examination, they admitted, quote, that your houses are in good structural order and in good sanitary condition. You have nothing to be ashamed of. Unfortunately, that wasn't echoed in the press. And so you'll find some historians still talking about Lawrence O'Neill as a slum landlord. In January 1916, his name went forward for uh, Lord Mayor, but he was defeated by the incumbent Lord Mayor, Councillor Gallagher. But he did receive a good number of votes. And then, out of the blue, he found himself arrested in 1916 on the basis of an anonymous comment that he was involved in the rising. Now, when you consider that practically everybody was opposed to the, to the rising at that stage, it was a, an occasion of particular embarrassment for him as a councillor, and brought off, marched off to Richmond Barracks. When he was there, of course, typically he settled in and knew a lot of the people there and became a great admirer and friend of De Valeris. And when the mood changed, what was an embarrassment in the past now became a political bonus. And it is no surprise to anybody when Lawrence O'Neill was elected Lord Mayor in January 1917. 
Amongst his immediate problems was the fact that it was a very severe winter, there was a shortage of food, and many people were hungry. So he set about in the campaign of visiting the, the richer people in the, in, the, the, in the area and various organizations and getting them to denote, to um, present food for the, for the poor. And in, in the process then he approached the Royal Irish Automobile Club and asked them to provide cars to bring the food from place to place and to a particular central area. So not surprisingly, a uh, historian of the Royal Automobile, uh, Royal Irish Automobile Club commented that Lawrence O'Neill, or Councillor Alderman Lawrence O'Neill, was a born diplomat with a gift for, him for reconciling opposing unionist and nationalist camps. He negotiated with the Chief Secretary Duke for the release of 120 prisoners in June 1917, and they were received in the Mansion House. Thereafter, he spent a great deal of his time working even on Christmas Day to, for the benefit of political prisoners or those at hunger strike. Travelled to Belfast and Dundalk, as well as, of course, to the Dublin prisons. Consequently, at the end of 1917, it was agreed that he was doing a good job and he was re-elected as Lord Mayor. Now, during 1918, as we know, the biggest challenge for the City Council and the Lord Mayor was the government introducing a compulsory conscription for Ireland. On the 8th of April, the Dublin City Council, as the Lord Mayor mentioned, issued a warning to the government that if conscription were put into operation, it would be resisted violently in every town and village in the country. The Lord Mayor was requested to invite Mr. John Dillon, Mr. De Valera, Mr. Joseph Devlin, Mr. Arthur Griffith, and representatives of the Irish Trade Union Congress to meet him in conference in order to form a united Ireland opposition to conscription. He added to the list T.M. Healy, MP, and William O'Brien, MP, believing that a conference without them would be incomplete. He also suggested that Labour be represented by a member from the three main cities, Dublin, Belfast, and Cork. To get such diverse personalities to come together proved onerous and took a good deal of time. And as the days passed, the country became impatient with the delay in providing a common front. It was particularly difficult to get John Dillon to agree to a date. He claimed that conscription would be best fought in the House of Commons. And De Valera suggested, De Valera and Griffith indeed suggested that the conference go ahead without Dillon. By a little tact and patience, as O'Neill put it, the first meeting of the conference was eventually held in the Mansion House on the 18th of April, all attending. As I had summoned the conference, I was in the chair, and it took all the ingenuity I possessed to make a, favorites, a favorable start. He recorded his memory of the participants, John Dillon was solemn and no doubt realised that the power of his party was diminishing and that by attending the conference he was playing into the hands of Sinn Féin. <coughs> Healy was right away insuppressible as usual. De Valera, lovable but voluble, as once pleading his inexperience. Griffith, silent, but very little escaped him. Devlin, carefully guarding Dillon from Healy's attacks. And O'Brien from Mallow, with a look of paternal affection towards his comrade, Tim. Labour, calmly surveying. Johnson as secretary, taking notes. William O'Brien, 
pulling his well-trimmed beard and looking very dogged. A man with a dark exterior and one who would go a long way to get his own back. But in my dealings with him during labour troubles and as a member of Dublin Corporation, I always found him as straight as the barrel of a gun. Egan TC from Cork, a Justice of the Peace, a man of quiet and unassuming disposition. His great anxiety was how conscription affected Cork. Despite their motley character, the members were borne up by the expectation of the great mass of the population. Initially, O'Neill had envisioned a conference representative of nationalists and unionists. But as he informed William O'Brien MP, he had had difficulty coming up with suitable unionist names. The evening heard for that day, the 18th of April, carried to the headline, a fateful day, momentous meeting of the Irish leaders, a united Ireland. The text commented that the eyes of every Irish man and woman were turned to Dublin, awaiting with feverish anxiety the decision of the conference. And there could be no doubt that the people of the country would stand by the decision. The Irish hierarchy were meeting at Maynooth to discuss the situation. The people were advised to remain calm and continue to be united. In terms of the United Front, Lawrence and other members of the conference were clear that the support of the bishops was highly important. He had arranged with Archbishop Walsh of Dublin, who was a noted nationalist, that the conference committee would meet on the 18th of April, when the hierarchy were in session in Maynooth. The Mansion House Conference approved a defiant declaration proposed by de Valera. He refused to change an iota of the declaration. And he later explained to Lawrence O'Neill that the reason he was so reluctant to change anything was that early that morning he had met, he had gone to the Episcopal House, Dr. Walsh's house, and had discussed the, the wording to be presented and which would also be presented to the bishops. And so he didn't want to cause confusion and have any change. His declaration proclaimed Ireland's separate and distinct nationhood and the principle of the government of nations and the principle that the government of nations derived its just powers from the consent of the governed and hence Britain had no authority to impose compulsory conscription on Ireland against the expressed wish of the Irish people. The conference committee designed a pledge to be taken by the public. We pledge ourselves solemnly to one another to resist conscription by the most effective means at our disposal. A deputation from the conference on the proposal of William O'Brien, the socialist, travelled to Maynooth. And Lawrence O'Neill was careful to ensure that Tim Healy and John Dillon travelled in separate cars. <laughs> and after lunch with the bishops, the Lord Mayor presented the pledge to Cardinal Lowe for consideration. My colleague Dr. Brian Hanley will be discussing the role of the bishops in the whole situation. But after they returned from Maynooth and they were in jubilant form, the uh, conference reassembled at the Mansion House and they drew up a manifesto which appeared with the bishop's, man with the bishop's statement next morning. At 10 o'clock that night, the 18th of April, the conference adjourned until the next day. And on their emergence from the Mansion House, 
they were greeted by an enthusiastic crowd of some 10,000 people. There was, as the Freemans Journal observed, a new and united spirit in Dublin. De Valera was carried shoulder high by Sinn Féin supporters. John Dillon was followed to his, uh, his, his uh, place where he was staying by a large crowd as well. And he gave a fitting valediction to the day. Quote, I only desire to say good night. And if the nationalists of Ireland hold together, no power on earth will conscript them out of Ireland. It became part of O'Neill's role to hold those nationalist conference people together in the succeeding weeks. And it was no easy task because Tim Healy kept on with his barbed tongue uh, insulting Dylan at every opportunity. And it got to a point where Dylan and Devlin were going to walk out of the conference. And at that stage, it was up to Lawrence O'Neill to face down Tim Healy, who had the most acerbic tongue in Ireland. It was no easy task. But it was part of the particular gift of O'Neill that after his discussion with uh, T uh, Tim Healy, Healy went back into the conference and from then on himself and Dylan worked in a most amiable fashion and both agreed that only Lawrence O'Neill could have worked such a miracle. A fitting finish, thank you. Thomas,